PilotSafety.org teaches free FAA safety classes all over the U.S. thanks to help from Avemco, the national sponsor of the FAA WINGS program. Most people know Gary is the top international expert in single pilot IFR using Autopilots, Avidyne, Foreflight, and Garmin Avionics. But to really understand the guy in the pink shirt, let's look at the numbers. Gary is a lead rep for the FAA safety team. He has over 8,300 hours, is an ATP, and a master flight, instrument, and multi-engine instructor. Of the 112,000 instructors in the U.S., less than 800 have ever been named Master Instructor. Gary is one of only nine to have earned this designation from the great state of Texas. Gary has trained airlines, flight schools, and pilots from Alaska to Australia in over 50 different aircraft types, including light jets, turboprops, and pistons. Gary was chosen to be the only national training provider for two huge companies, Avidyne and Genesis SDEC. Please welcome my friend, the guy in the pink shirt, the one and only 2019 FAA National Flight Instructor of the Year, Gary Reeves. How y'all doing? It's uh, Gary, the guy in the pink shirt. Thanks for the uh, animated fake round of applause. So, you know, I sound really impressive on paper and I appreciate that. If y'all taught Avidyne, Garmin, Autopilots, and Foreflight every day for 20 years, you'd probably be, be reasonably good at it too. But I know nothing about almost everything else. So if I occasionally make a mistake or say something goofy on this video, well, I'm only human and uh, just please be patient with me. But I'm going to say some really important stuff today, at least in my opinion. So when I do... I would love it if you would take a screen capture or a, a screen share and uh, you know it's pretty easy to do and I just want you to know that you can share this entire video you can share the handouts uh, yes I've spent an awful lot of time and resources developing this and I want you to give it away to everybody so if you see this camera I want you to take a screenshot and share it with everybody the first one just being a quote from uh, Dr. Wayne Dyer. I'm going to say some crazy stuff today. Crazy meaning I'm going to conflict with some things that you just know to be true. So I was at a owner's convention for a uh, large owner's group. And I just recommend everybody put the gear down and the first notch of flaps five miles before the initial approach fix when shooting an instrument approach. And the reason I do that is I have a concern. I've done a lot of research and I've found that people who drop the gear uh, at the final approach fix when intercepting a glide slope tend to have a lot of gear up landings. Uh, I've just, I've got the research to prove it. The reason is, is dropping your gear at the very last minute, suffering from something called decision fatigue, which we're going to get into, you get so fixated on glide paths and localizer or RNAV courses and looking for an airport that you don't notice the gear's not actually down and you tend to have gear up landings. So I, I say, I just think it's safer to get the gear down early when you're not busy at the highest workload point. Well, the chief safety officer of this group was so upset at this convention, he took me outside and said, you can't tell people that. Uh, and if you put the gear down early, you're going to cause these pilots to have stall spin accidents. Well, and I just kind of stared at him. I, I've never quite understood why putting the gear down and slowing down an airplane and making it essentially more stable would cause this plane to magically flip upside down. I mean, I know it's a high-performance airplane, but I don't get that. So why was he so upset? Like, he was so mad, he was shaking. And, like, why was he so upset? Because 
it's different than what he knew to be true. He's a former jet pilot, and he was trained, you drop your gear to track your glide path. Well, even the airlines don't do that anymore. That That's not even a thing anymore. But I'm going to say some stuff today, and this is from Wayne Dyer, and he's a very smart guy. So when you say something that conflicts with what somebody knows to be true, in other words, it threatens their primacy, flight instructors will know that law, They are afraid of new ideas. They are loaded with prejudices, not based on anything in reality, but based on if something is new, I reject it immediately because it's frightening to me. What they do instead, they just stay with what they know. So I want you to be open to some crazy Gary ideas today and just say, well, what if what I say tonight is possible? don't need to agree with everything I say. In fact, if you disagree with me, I think that's just as valuable. But what if I was right? So let's start out with a quick audience of, and I know you're on the other side of a computer screen, but raise your right hand anyway and repeat after me. I, state your name, and I know you didn't actually say your name. I know you said state your name. It's a lot funnier in front of a live audience, I promise you. When Gary says something different than I have been taught before, will not throw anything at him. Again, funnier in front of a live audience. Okay, so what are the biggest causes of pilot accidents? And AOPA is so good with reviewing accidents. And the NTSB is so good with reviewing accidents. And we keep seeing the biggest causes of pilot accidents. What are you all familiar with? When, when you hear another pilot died because of blank, what keeps coming up for you? Well. I seem to hear a lot of get their itis or stall spin, that base to final thing, right? Or VFR and IMC or fuel exhaustion. How does somebody run out of gas? Uh, uh, rarely there's a mechanical failure or sometimes icing or there's a bunch of other stuff, right? But I think those are the most common ones we hear a lot. Well, before we get into that, I want to define three really important terms that are going to be critical for this class to make a difference. I need to define what good means. I need to define what normal means. And I need to define what not good enough means. It seems kind of silly, but let's just start out with the word good. And I'm going to ask you, are you a good pilot? Well, right off the bat, I'm going to say yes. In fact, I'm willing to put a $100 cash bet then I'm going to win. I promise you, if you're listening to this, you're a good pilot. Not because you're listening to me, but because you're interested in becoming better. And that right there off the bat proves to me you're a good pilot. But if you have already passed a a private pilot, sport pilot, whatever, then I know you're a good pilot. Why? Because you were trained by a certified instructor who was certified by the FAA. They met the minimum standards. So if you've been trained by a certified instructor, you, you... are a good pilot. You had to have passed a written test. So you had to understand some basic laws. You probably passed at least one, if not multiple check rides with good designated pilot examiners to good FAA standards, either a PTS or the new ACS. And again, this is the cash bet that I was guaranteed to win. If you're listening to me, you're very active in continuing education. Of course, my favorite group, pilotsafety.org. Hey, yay for the pink. AOPA is so good at this, the Air Safety Foundation. The FA Wings Program, NAFI. There's so much good stuff on YouTube and Facebook. Now, you got to be careful with YouTube and Facebook because there's good and bad, but there's great stuff. There's some great magazines out there, right? There's all these ways, owners groups. There's all these ways you can be active. Um... If you're a good pilot and you have a GPS, an autopilot, an iPad program like ForeFlight, you probably got good at it by just playing with it, right? You can get get pretty darn good at an Avidyne, a Garmin GPS, an autopilot, and like an iPad program like ForeFlight just by playing with it. Uh, Watching some YouTube free videos, asking some questions on Facebook, and doing some work with local CFI. I got to tell you, I encourage all of you to do that, and and that will actually make you pretty good at that stuff. And to really be good, you got to fly, I think we all agree, on a regular basis. I would really love it if everybody could fly 10 hours a month. 
hey, I, you know, look, I fly about seven days a week, some, some months, but reality is, you know, people have families and jobs and, and, and not always unlimited bank accounts. But if you can fly at least a couple hours a month, I think that that counts, right? Now I need to define what's normal. Well, normal flying conditions for every pilot is going to be different, right? Normal flying conditions for a 50-hour private pilot is going to be different than me, who has two decades and 8,300 hours. For example, a very low-time 50-hour private pilot flying a 152 might be pretty comfortable with a, a seven or eight knot crosswind. I was pretty comfortable landing my 206 in a 20 to 25 knot crosswind. A 2,500 hour commercial pilot in a TBM 850 might be pretty darn comfortable flying into light icing, uh, moderate rain, uh, and flying down to a 500 or 400 foot ceiling on uh, an LPV WAS approach. A brand new instrument rated pilot in a 172 with uh, a Garmin 430 and a G5 but no autopilot might say, well, absolutely no icing and I'm really only comfortable going down to about a 600 foot ceiling. So, you know, it's different for everybody and, and you're going to know what's good for you. Same thing with airspace and radio communication. I'm perfectly happy landing a, a Saratoga at Boston Logan. I just did it a couple months ago. I'm perfectly happy going into LAX. Well, not everybody is. Maybe you're more comfortable going into small class deltas, right? I'm perfectly happy going IFR through Newark airspace and getting 10 amendments to my clearance in 10 minutes. You might be more happy getting, you know, leave me alone and, and just you know, talk at ACC occasionally. Almost everybody that is instrument rated that's had the same GPS and the same autopilot and the same iPad program, again, I always use the term for flight, uh, but there's some other great ones out there, that's had that GPS, autopilot, and for flight, and they're playing for five or six years, is pretty familiar with how to put in a flight plan, file an IFR flight plan, and shoot an approach with vectors to final, and I, I think that's fine. And I think almost everybody listening is pretty comfortable flying a plane as long as they don't have any mechanical problems and no outside sudden stress. So we've decided that you're a good pilot. We've decided what's normal flying conditions for you. So when is being a good pilot not going to be good enough? Well, when the weather goes beyond your normal experience. If you don't have any experience in icing and you experience sudden moderate icing, well, now being a good pilot is probably not going to be good enough. If you're used to flying in very light, what I call light Charlie airspace, and all of a sudden you're going through, you know, JFK airspace, well, that's you know, that's going to add some conflicts. If you're instrument rated, but you know, you fly mostly VFR and you do six approaches every six months with uh, a safety pilot just to kind of stay legally current and you're flying along and you get three amended clearances in 10 minutes with some totally unexpected route changes and you have to divert to an unpublished DME fix. Well, being pretty good at your GPS and pretty good at your autopilot and pretty good at fore flight, that's probably not going to help you a whole lot. If you have a failure in the airplane, now the engine failure is really, really rare. In 8,300 hours, I've had one actual engine failure. I've had one actual in flight engine failure and, or an engine fire. The engine fire happened at 200 feet. It's a great story, a lot of fun. But most engines are not going to quit if you simply put gas in the airplane and do your maintenance, right? And there's not a whole lot we can do to prevent the sudden, rare mechanical failure. What is much more common and seems to happen on a daily basis is pilot-induced failures, you know, not putting gas to the engine or misprogramming an autopilot or not understanding and misprogramming a GPS or, or an iPad program. But really when good is not good enough is once there's some outside stress or some fear. 
So let's do kind of a typical accident review. And I think the most reviewed accident on the planet is the JFK Jr. one. So what did JFK Jr. did wrong? I mean, this I think everybody knows this accident, right? So if I asked for opinions of everything JFK Jr. did wrong, I think people would say, well, there was get there itis Like he had to get to this wedding thingy, right? Uh, he flew marginal VFR and actually ended up in IMC, VFR and IMC. He had an injured foot, like the, the, he had a cast on or something, right? Uh, he was under immense family pressure. There's that external pressure. And once he started to lose control, for goodness sakes, why didn't you just turn on the autopilot, right? So we've done an accident review. Did any of that make you a better pilot? Well, let me ask you a question. If I was a pretty popular YouTube guy named Grider and I had a million subscribers and I just said JFK Jr. was a stupid, spoiled, rich brat and I made fun of him, would that make you a better pilot? Because that's what he does to everybody who dies. Well, because he makes money off advertising and the more inflammatory he is and the more subscribers he gets, the more money he makes. But is that helpful? Well, okay, what if we just did a normal accident review? What if we just read the NTSB accident review? And it came up with get their itis and injured foot and family pressure. And would that make you a better pilot? Well, let me ask you all a question. Was anyone listening to this computer video planning on flying into IMC without an instrument rating with an injured foot and killing yourself and your spouse. But now that you've heard about this, you're not going to do it? Well, no. So now that this is probably one of the most published GA accidents out there, has the GA accident rate gone down dramatically? Well, no. So I'm not sure the normal accident reviews are actually helping. Let's do one I've spent a lot of time on. This is in Wallaceville, Texas. Pilot was flying a beach bonanza from Destin, Florida. While flying, and this is a long flight, a long time in beach bonanza. While flying over Beaumont, Texas, the pilot kept switching back and forth between fuel tanks due to one fuel gauge reporting higher than the other. So he was going back and forth multiple times. And this is all, you know, from the passenger. This is an interview with the passenger after the accident. Then there was a repetitive beeping heard, and the pilot said there was an autopilot malfunction and he would hand fly. So he turned off the autopilot, which is not a bad idea, right? You know, most important thing to know about an autopilot is how to turn it off when it's not behaving. Then after he passed Beaumont, a really nice airport, but he just kind of kept going, a panel warning light turned on. And then a loud buzzer or continuous beep, the passenger wasn't quite sure, for the automatic trim automatic pitch trim was heard. Then some circuit breakers were checked and then the pilot asked the passenger to pull the automatic pitch trim circuit breaker. At this point, the pilot told ATC that they were having a slight electrical problem. Slight. And then as they approach Anahawk, Texas, the engine quit. Total loss of power. Don't worry, the pilot then restarted the engine. And then the engine quit again. And then after all that, the pilot declared an emergency and requested vectors. Far too little, far too late. Ended up in the middle of a lake. The cockpit and the cabin areas were totally submerged in Lake Miller. So the engine quit. They ended up in a lake. But rescue personnel still reported that flames from the fire surrounded the airplane. Think how bad that accident must have been. The engine was not running. They're in the middle of a lake and there was still a huge fire. Good news is, is the passenger still was able to exit and was rescued by a helicopter. Of course, the pilot died, right? Let me show you what this looks like on a map. So we've been flying for several hours. Before he gets to Momont, he's got a bunch of autopilot problems. He overflies some really nice airports before he splashes in the middle of a lake. So based on what we talked about earlier, what were the biggest causes in this particular pilot accident? 
Well, if we just take the most common ones, I think people would go, well, there's some get their itis. Uh, without getting deep into it, maybe we could think maybe a stall spin, maybe some fuel exhaustion, maybe some mechanical problems. So what can we get from this report? Well, can you all figure out all the bad decisions he made? Cool, cool. Uh, can you all now promise to not do the same bad decisions? Yeah, cool, cool. Uh, can we all feel superior and tell other people how dumb he was? Well, of course you wouldn't do that, right? Telling other people how people who passed away and people love them, that they were dumb, that that's just cruel. That, that's not helpful. None of you would ever do that. But what if I told you everything you thought about causes of accidents was not true? What if get their itis, stall spin, VFR and IMC, fuel exhaustion, all that stuff was false? You see, the NDSB uh, AOPA does just some amazing accident report uh, invested like uh, reviews. The thing is, is the GA accident report, the GA accident rate's not going down. So all of these accident reviews are, are really interesting, but it's not changing anything. So let me ask you a question. And now we're going to go really down a seemingly strange path, but I think we're going to make a huge difference. So true or false, folks, to be a good pilot, you got to be good at multitasking. Would most people say true or false? Unfortunately, it's false. You know why? There is no such thing as multitasking. It is not physically possible. I don't care what you've been told, especially by your boss who buys you four computer screens and makes you have an email window and a Word document, or I'm a Mac guy, pages, while you're listening to voicemails, multitasking, it can't happen, folks. It's not physically possible. The human brain don't work that way. And I know everybody wants to show. So, well, let's see the proof. Well, no problem. How about I just let you prove it? So we asked you to print out some handouts. So we're going to make you all the volunteers. Get your handout out. And on the handout, there's a, a white and a gray box at the top and then some grids down at the bottom. And we're going to start with the white and the gray box at the top. And most important thing to do is please don't write down anything. So just put your pen or your pencil down. Don't do anything until I say the word go and say begin, okay? So all we're going to do, and again, please don't do anything now, is in the top line, after I tell you to start, you're going to write, I am a great multitasker in the top. Again, not doing it now, but after I tell you to start. And then you've written some words at the top. Then we're just going to write a string of numbers down at the bottom. And we're just going to write the numbers 1 through 20 sequentially. You need to be neat and you need to put a space between each one. And what I mean is you're going to write the number one, then a space, two, space, three, space, four, space, five, space, all the way up through 20. So everybody see what I want you to do? Of course, you haven't started. You're on, on the top. You're first going to write the words, I am a great multitasker. And then on the bottom, sequentially, you're going to write the number one, then a space, two, then a space, three, all the way up through 20. Okay, get your pen. And when I say the word go, you're going to begin. You all ready? Wait for it, wait for it, wait for it. Go. When you're done, look up at the screen and write down your time. And I'm going to stop. Uh, the average person finishes in 10 to 20 seconds, so I stopped it at 12. And if you didn't finish, that's fine. You were probably just trying to be too neat. So can you read your writing? Are the numbers legible? Great. Put down the pen. Just put it down. Hide it from yourself. We're going to do that same thing again, but that was not multitasking. That was write a sentence, then write a string of numbers. Let's see if multitasking is actually physically possible. We're going to go to that grid. And again, please keep your pen down. Don't do this. We're, going to, we're actually going to multitask. We're going to write the sentence and the numbers at the same time. 
in the top, you're going to write, I am a great multitasker, but you're going to do it one letter at a time. And if you notice, I am a great multitasker has 20 letters, not counting the spaces. And I happen to have given you 20 numbers, not counting the spaces. So in the first box, you're going to put the number, uh, or you're going to put the letter I. And then in the first gray box underneath it, you're going to write the number one. Then you're going to leave a blank white box and a blank gray box. Then you're going to write the letter A. And then underneath that, you're going to write the number two. Just keep your pen down. This is what you're going to do. It's going to look like that as fast as you can, making sure you leave a space. This is going to be a little bit harder. See how we're going to do it? All right, remember, don't start until I say go. So everybody see how you're going to do it? All right, wait for it, wait for it, wait for it, and go. You got to do it fast. You got to do it fast. Hurry up, hurry up, hurry up. Don't forget to leave those spaces. If you don't leave a space, it's going to be wrong. So make sure you leave those spaces. Go, 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 go. We're running out of time. Remember, you probably did it in 12 seconds. So you got to hurry, 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 and stop. Well, I stopped it at 12 seconds. Did you get as far as you did the first time? Are your numbers and letters as neatly printed as the last time? Any mistakes? Are they neatly in each box? So what we have proved, and you've actually proved yourself, is that multitasking, it's not physically possible. What you've demonstrated is that humans can't multitask. Humans do something called task switching. And it was really clearly proved, uh, so you can see it, using something called a functional MRI at the National Institute of Health in Paris, France. It's called INSERM. And what they did is they looked at the frontal cortex of the human brain. That's where your critical decisions are actually made. This is where the logic centers are. And they gave participants in the functional MRI two relatively simple tasks and said, do them at the same time. And they couldn't. The frontal cortex actually split into half, and they watched the left and the right side of the brain switch back and forth. Check an email, look at the Word document. Check an email, look at the Word document. Check an email, look at the calendar. Check an email. Now, obviously, this happened much, much faster, but they proved the human brain cannot do two tasks at once. Now, you can do some automatic thing. Absolutely, you can walk down the street and breathe because those are automated things, right? But anything requiring thought, you can't do at the same thing. What you do is task squishing. Now, it happens incredibly quick, but there is a measurable delay between each task and it causes errors. They've proven that it causes errors. And that's just two things. When we start adding three, four, and five tasks, each additional task uses another 20% of the brain and causes more and more errors. And the longer you do it, the worse the errors and the delays actually get. So David Meyer, a professor of psych over at the University of Michigan, wrote a pretty long report after doing his own studies, and he said, as long as you're performing complicated tasks that require the same parts of the brain, like talking to ATC and programming a GPS and looking at an engine monitor and looking outside for traffic, all those require the same parts of the brain. And you need to devote all the capacity for those tasks. There just aren't going to be the resources available to add anything more. Once you start to make things more complicated, when life gets outside your normal, things get messier, and as a result, there's going to be interference with one or more of those tasks. You either got to slow down on one of the tasks, or you're going to start making a lot more mistakes. So this is just two of the hundreds of studies that I've looked at, and multiple studies show that task switching People take much longer to accomplish a basic simple task, and that the average IQ drops 10 points for women, 15 for men. In other words, you're reducing your mental uh, quotient to about that of a good eight-year-old. It is the exact same equivalent as losing a night's sleep 
or having the blood alcohol level of about 0.04, or half the legal limit of driving. And it causes something called decision fatigue. And this is the important part. Now imagine doing that same test. Imagine writing a sentence, one letter at a time, with a corresponding number after being awake for eight hours, for two and a half hours straight, in a moving airplane, while listening, talking, and switching to different air traffic control frequencies, while programming GPS, autopilots, and foreflight in worse weather than expected with a potential mechanical problem and outside stress. You get to see it. You get to see what decision fatigue is. So where did decision fatigue, the term decision fatigue, come from? Well, one of the very first studies was actually in Israel. And what they did is they studied, and this is just fascinating, they studied an Israeli parole board. And what does a parole board have to do with aviation? Well, a lot, as it turns out. So if you don't know what a parole board is, it's really simple. You're in prison. You've served a percentage of your sentence. You've been a really good boy or girl, and you want to get out. So the parole board says, yes, you can go home, or no, you have to serve out your full sentence. So they did this fairly simple study. They didn't sit in on the hearings. They didn't want the names or the crimes or the sentences. They didn't want the names or the backgrounds of the parole board judges. They just wanted numbers. Uh, they wanted what time was the parole hearing and was the vote yes released for parole or no stay in prison. And that's all they wanted. And Israel went, well, sure, why not? That doesn't hurt anything. They found out something really interesting. If your parole hearing was in the morning session before lunch, before 11 a.m., you had a 63 to 70% chance of being granted parole. They were totally willing to take a chance and go, yeah, sure, why not? You've been good, let's let you out. If your ticket came up for a parole hearing after lunch, which started at 1 p.m., you had about a 70% chance of being denied and kept in prison. Well, what's the difference? Well, the first sign of decision fatigue is the inability to change the status quo or change plans. Does that sound familiar in aviation? Has anybody here ever used the term get their itis? Folks, there's no such thing as get their itis. They don't keep going because they want to get there. They're suffering from decision fatigue and they just get stuck on the plan. Yeah. In fact, decision fatigue is so powerful. That's how we make grocery stores. No kidding. There's so much science behind this. That's how we design grocery stores. Really? Think about it. You are typically going to hit a grocery store after being at work all day, right? So you've been awake all day. You haven't eaten dinner. You got a little low blood sugar. You've been awake for way more than six hours. Six hours is when decisions start suffering, right? And look, you need four things, but you can't just find four things. You got to walk down 20 aisles. That forces you to make a lot of decisions. And you can't just pick up a gallon of milk because there's like 15 different types of milk. And you got to look for the expiration date and you got to check sales prices. In other words, we know you're tired. We know your blood sugar's low. And we're going to force you to make a lot of decisions quickly and make you more tired. In other words, we're going to deliberately increase decision fatigue. And what happens when decision fatigue increases, so do poor decisions. And the second sign of decision fatigue is making impulsive and reckless decisions, like buying the Kit Kat and the bag of Cheetos and the People magazine when you finally stagger exhausted up to the checkout stand. Have you ever noticed that the impulse, impulsive, items are at the checkout stand because that's where you're going to buy it. If they kept the Cheetos in an aisle, you wouldn't buy them. Right. How many of you have thought the bag of Cheetos seemed like a good idea? 
Well, it was to you at the time because you're suffering from decision fatigue. The entire science of decision fatigue is based on how they lay out a grocery store. So here's a great picture for y'all to take. This is a great screenshot. If we want to fight decision fatigue, you got to slow down and make as many decisions as you can before you get in the plane. So let me ask you a question, folks. When do most accident happen? When do most accidents happen in flight? Do most fatal accidents happen during takeoff cruise or after flying for a couple hours during the final approach and landing phase? Well, yeah, every everybody knows that they happen after flying for a couple hours. When is workload and the number of decisions highest? Well, that, that's going to be at the end of the flight. When is fatigue going to be highest? Well, what if it's not fatigue? What if it's decision fatigue? Everybody, it's a great screenshot for you. So what are some factors that increase decision fatigue and lower the quality of decisions? Well, how long have you been awake? Anything over six hours, folks. You're not going to be making as good of decisions. How many decisions you've made? If you've ever had to make a lot of decisions in one day, you know the decisions at the end of the day are not as good as the ones at the beginning. How fast you make decisions. Man, if you have to make a lot of decisions quickly, they're not going to be good. And the absolutely worst thing is when the frontal cortex gets poisoned. There's two really great ways to poison the frontal cortex. Uh, my favorite way is just alcohol, right? Anybody here ever tried to argue with a drunk? Can they make a rational decision when they're drunk? Of course not, right? The other really cool way to paralyze or destroy the logical decision-making of your frontal cortex is a, a hormone called adrenaline. It will totally lock you up and paralyze where you just do absolutely nothing. In one really interesting study, a fear release of adrenaline is the equivalent of a 0.12 blood alcohol or being 50% over the legal limit to drive. You are so stupid at that point that you cannot make a good decision. So if you ask JFK Jr., if you could conjure up the ghost and say, why didn't you turn on the autopilot? He would look at you and go, what autopilot? There's no chance he could have survived that because he was suffering from something called adrenaline paralysis or the end and fatal stage of decision fatigue. So what do these three people have in common? And please don't, don't bring political comments. There's no reason for political comments in aviation. But would you all agree that those three people have been successful in their careers? Well, sure. You know what those three people have in common? They don't pick out different clothes in the morning. The President Obama, Steve Jobs, and Mark Zuckerberg. President Obama only owned like two different suits. He owned like six gray ones and six blue ones. Oh, and I'm sure he owned a couple tuxes. He didn't pick a different suit. He literally walked in the morning and they were all the same. They had some gray ones and some blue ones. He just picked the first one he got off the hanger. If he was doing formal, he picked out a tux. Steve Jobs, uh, I think he had about a billion gray turtlenecks. Mark Zuckerberg's got three outfits. He's got a casual, a work, and uh, I'm going to a party thing. Now, look, I'm nowhere as successful as these people, but I got to tell you, you wander into my closet in Texas, and there's about 23 pink polos. I don't waste a decision on something silly like picking out a shirt because I'm saving that decision for later. Now, Steve Jobs and Mark Zuckerberg also have a policy. Well, Steve Jobs had a policy. No business meetings after 11 a.m. Why? Because after about six hours of being awake, they're both early risers. After six hours of being awake, they don't trust that they're going to have too many good decisions left. So what are the signs of decision fatigues in pilot? Well, pretty simple. They'll just put off making a decision. Why would so many fatal accident pilots not land at the five or six really good airports they fly over? Well, they're just putting off the decision. They'll become impulsive and start making random decisions that don't seem to have an effect. They won't declare the emergency. And I got fixated on this one. For years, I've told people the only way to survive an emergency is declare an emergency before they have one. But I was a little off because 
they don't think it's an emergency. Uh, denial, not just a river in Egypt. And they will eventually, if they get just totally scared, lock up completely in indecision and just do nothing. So if we took the causes of decision fatigue, like being awake for a long time, making lots of decisions, some outside stress, increased workload with making more decisions, and fear. And then we took signs of decision fatigue, like procrastination, avoidance or denial, impulsivity, and adrenaline paralysis or indecision. And we redid that accident review in Wallaceville. A pilot was flying a beach bonanza from Destin, Florida. He'd been awake for a long time. While flying over Beaumont, Texas, he began to switch back and forth between fuel tanks due to one fuel gauge reporting higher than another, making lots of decisions, becoming a little impulsive, wouldn't you say? A repetitive beeping was heard. Well, that's some stress. And he said he would hand fly. Well, that's some procrastination with some impulsive decision making. Turned off an autopilot, which increases workload normally. But I think in this case it was right. But it is going to force him to make more decisions. And then a warning light came on. And that's going to increase his stress. And then a buzzer goes off, and that's going to increase his stress. Then he's going to start checking circuit breakers and have a passenger pull a circuit breaker. And then he's going to tell ATC, we're having a slight electrical problem. Well, that's just denial. Dude, that's a mayday. After you've been making all those decisions, why aren't you declaring a mayday? Well, that's avoidance. And then you lose the engine. Well, you better believe he's scared. And if he wasn't terrified after the first engine failure, well, when it stopped again, you know it's all over. At that point, the brain's going to lock up, total adrenaline paralysis. He loses control and he goes into the middle of the lake. And of course he's going to die. So if we look at the map, procrastination, followed by impulsivity, followed by not declaring the emergency, followed by adrenaline paralysis and the fatal accident. Kind of a different way of looking at things. So what are we going to do to uh, reduce decision fatigue in pilots? Well, pretty easy, folks. Let's just reduce the number of decisions. Uh, you got to use a written checklist every 30 minutes in flight. BCTF comes, right? You got to use autopilots a whole lot more. There's so many really smart people going, you need to hand fly more. Absolutely not, folks. You got to let that autopilot do the work in flight. Now, once every 30 days, leave your autopilot off, hand fly to a VOR with no flight plan in a GPS and hand fly a circling approach if you're instrument ready. You got to keep those old skills up. But folks, when you're flying, GPS, GPS steering, autopilot on the whole time because that's reducing decision fatigue. You got to pick an alternate before you get into bad weather. If, if you think flying into known bad weather, shooting an approach, going missed, and then diverting is going to work out, I got to tell you, it's not. It, it, it All the research says it's not. And you can't just be good at avionics and an iPad. You got to go way beyond that. Because what if it exceeds your normal? And if you're going to use a written checklist on the plane, you better use the frat on you. Everybody take a screenshot of that for me. So let's do a test. If Joe's a commercial pilot with 400 hours and in, in instrument rating, and he's owned his Saratoga for 10 years, and he's did a flight review six months ago with an IPC after getting a new GPS autopilot and a panel upgrade. So he flew with an, a, a well-qualified local instructor. He did an IPC after the panel upgrade, right? And he flies four to five hours per month. 
Would you all say he's a good pilot? I certainly would say he's a good pilot. I mean, I would absolutely be proud of this guy and I'd be happy to get in his airplane and fly with him anytime. And he's been at Sun and Fun for a couple days and it's the last day and he just needs to go home to his, his own airport, 24 Alpha. And it's his home airport. Okay, he's lived there for, I don't know, 10 or 15 years. It's non-towered, but oh, come on. Most airports in the U.S. are non-towered. And it's overcast at 1,900 feet with two miles. Well, he's an instrument rating. Come on. A 1,900-foot ceiling and two miles of visibility, that's almost thats almost VFR. It's got an RNAV approach. It's LNAV, which would be LNAV plus V, right? To runway 33 with a decision height of 1,553, which is 500 feet you know, almost 500 feet below the overcast, so great. It's in a small mountain valley, just 2,800 foot peaks, and everyone's like, well, that's not even real mountains. Uh, the wind's 100 at 15 or 16, so he's going to circle to runway 15, but it's only an 8 knot crosswind. So a 400 hour instrument rated pilot that just did an IPC that flies on a regular basis with a 1,900 foot ceiling and two miles and very light rain, circling the land at his own home airport with an eight knot crosswind, I don't think any pilot would really think twice about going home. I probably wouldn't. Uh, and besides, the wife really had to be home tomorrow morning for work. And that's unfortunately the way a lot of accident reports start because of decision fatigue, which a lot of people aren't talking about yet, which we're gonna change after tonight. So if you went over to the App Store and you search for the FRAT, Flight Risk Assessment Tool from the FAA, and it's four or five bucks, it's from the FAA, and you put these factors in, you might see something a little different. Hopefully you use a written checklist you know, on, on the plane for a pre-flight. And now we're going to do one on Joe. So Joe Cool's in there. He's got 400 hours. He's leaving Lakeland. He's in Saratoga. He's got way more than 40 hours. And we upgraded him to a commercial pilot. We're going to save that. And let's just do a quick risk assessment. Right now it's low risk. He's certainly IFR current. And he's going to his own home airport of Too Far Alpha. Now, he he's, hasn't quite flown as much as he wants to. He's only flown about 13 hours in the least 90 days. He's been at Sun and Fun all day. He only got about seven hours of sleep last night. Hasn't received instructions in the last 90 days. So that'll raise the risk up a little bit. And you can see at the top how the risk factor is just going up a little bit. Now, he's got less than 40 hours with the new avionics. Uh, it's going to be a night flight by the time he lands. And... It's a 16 knot wind with only an 8 knot crosswind. See that risk factor is just type tapping up a little bit, right? It is mountainous. I know it's not big mountains, but it's mountains. There's no tower. It's light rain. There's always obstacles in the mountains. See how it went red? Now let's add a circling approach. With two miles visibility and the wife has to be home tomorrow morning. Okay, it's blinking red. Now, this doesn't talk to the FAA. It's not gonna share data with anybody. It's not gonna rat you out. But I wonder if JFK Jr. had done this, do you think he might've reconsidered making the flight? If the really good pilot who died in Wallace, Texas had done this before he took off, do you think he might? have reconsidered? Maybe. Let's take a test. All right, get that second hand out, folks. Let's take a test. Multitasking. A, can be improved with training. B, gets easier the more you do it. C, is something women are better at than men. Or D, is a myth and not actually possible. I know at least half this audience is going to say C, but... Remember, it is actually D. People, when doing multiple tasks at the, quote, same time, 
A actually switch back and forth. We call it task switching with a delay in between. B cause errors increasing with the number of tasks. C increase decision fatigue or D all of the above. Well, of course, it's actually all of the above. Studies show decision fatigue reduces the abilities uh, ability to make good decisions. See, now I'm suffering from it. A, after about six hours of being awake. B, after making more decisions. C, if stress or fear is felt. Or D, all of the above. Everybody? Yeah, of course it's D, right? One of the earliest signs of decision fatigue is headache, sleepiness, the inability to change plans. We call that get there itis. Or D, making irrational and reckless decisions. Well, the earliest sign is the inability to change plans. The FAA FRAT app, Flight Risk Assessment Tool. A, gives more pre-flight weather information. B, shows active and upcoming TFRs. C, acts as a second opinion showing risk the pilot may not be aware of. Or D, rats you out and reports all the data you put into the FAA. Well, of course, it's only C. My concern and my opinion that I think we should share with every pilot and flight instructor out there is that the hidden biggest cause of pilot accidents is A, stall spins, B, VFR and IMC, C, engine failure, or D, decision fatigue. Well, folks, after a lot of time and a couple years of research, I actually think it's decision fatigue and that the other stuff is just kind of the stuff that happens at the end. Learning Avionics and Four Flight by Trial and Error, Watching YouTube and Asking Questions on Facebook. A is how most pilots get pretty good. I think that's 100% true. B covers the basics. I think that's 100% true. In fact, I think it's a good idea. I think every pilot should do it. C is fine as long as flight conditions are normal for that pilot. I think that's 100% true as well. D will increase decision fatigue and stress and fear when the flight conditions go beyond normal. Well, unfortunately, I think that's true as well. If pilot has decision fatigue, is pushed beyond their normal and by stress, and then becomes scared, they are most likely to A, postpone decisions, B, make irrational and reckless decisions. C, enter a state of adrenaline paralysis and do nothing. Or D, make bad decisions that seem correct to them. Unfortunately, what we've shown and have proven tonight, it's probably going to be the fatal accident. They're just going to lock up and do nothing. When reviewing accident reports, the best way to learn is A, look at an accident report and identify when decision fatigue and decision paralysis occurred. Look for the signs and symptoms, right? B, identify the bad decisions and just promise that you'll never make those. C, criticize the stupid pilot and say what they did wrong on YouTube. Or D, nothing can be learned, don't worry about it. Well, I think we all can agree that A, look for the decision fatigue signs and symptoms and look for that decision or adrenaline paralysis. The best ways to prevent decision fatigue and fatal accidents are A, use autopilots a whole lot more. B, use a written checklist on the aircraft and the FAA FRAT flight risk assessment tool app on pilots. C, get mastery level training beyond just being good. Or D, all of the above. Well, of course, the answer is D, all of the above. So the real best way to make a big impact and save the most lives and actually take a big step and reduce GA fatal accidents. Folks, I'm gonna ask you for some help. I'm gonna ask you if you're committed to it. I'm gonna ask you to be my partner. I think the best way to make a, a big impact and save the most lives is if you'll just share this course now. 
Uh, it's a free course. It's going to be on my website forever. Uh, you know where it is. Would you please share this with every pilot, every flight instructor, every owner's group via Carrier Pigeon and TikTok and ForeFlight and or for flight by Facebook and Twitter and social media. And I don't care if you hire a carrier pigeon or send it by telegram, but I really think if we start looking at accidents in a new way and we really take steps to reduce decision fatigue, we can actually reduce the fatalities and keep little planes and more pilots from dying on public TV. I think we can make a difference, but I can't do it alone. I'm really asking you, will you be my partner in safety? If you'd like to learn more about why I think all this stuff is true, uh, the single pilot IFR pro tips book that we're selling, geez, a couple hundred copies a month. Uh, it's 29 bucks. It's on my website. If you want to spend three days with me in your airplane and go way beyond good, I'm more than Happy to do that. I don't care. I'll go anywhere in the world. If you'd like to look at my avionics or four flight videos or my FR videos, great. More than happy to do that. Just go over to pilotsafety.org and use the code word fatigue. You'll get a $50 discount. But again, the most important thing to me is not that you buy my stuff. It'd be great if you did. But would you all please take a screenshot of that and email it and please post it on social media. Take a screenshot of that and back it up with comments and go, look, I just took this free one hour course and uh, and comment. You know, Gary makes some kind of crazy statements, but I think this can make a difference. If everybody seeing this shares this and we really go widespread, I think we can make a huge difference. So I just want to say, A, I was right. You are a good pilot. You just took an hour out of your life to make a difference. B, thank you. It means a lot to me that you were here. And C, listen, if you're walking around a convention and you see a guy in a pink shirt, come up and say hi. I'd be honored to meet you if I haven't yet. And uh, I'm out. So this is Gary, the guy in the pink shirt. Thanks for being my partner in GA Safety. And let's all work together to save some lives and reduce accidents. Gary, the guy in the pink shirt, I'm out. Thanks for being part of pilotsafety.org.